Okay. All right. Let me mute the the Google Meet. Okay. All right. Hello. Hi, Patrick. How are you? Hi, Manny. Good. How are you doing? Doing pretty good. All righty. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, hi. Welcome, everyone, to our, our Q&A session with Patrick Jones. Uh, Patrick Jones, for a little bit of an introduction, Patrick Jones was born in Belfast. Sorry, hold on. Just Belfast is right. You got it right, Manny. Yeah, the, the camera, there we go. All right, so Patrick Jones was born in Belfast, Northern Ireland and grew up during the height of the Ireland conflict. He was awarded a Prince Charles Trust Fund, a one-year tax-free initiative for underprivileged people with a business idea. He left home and sailed towards London to pursue his dream as an artist. He now lives with his wife, Katie, and two scruffy dogs in sunny Brisbane, Australia, where he teaches uh, at university. And when he's not traveling worldwide to the likes of Lucasfilms and Disney Studios, he's, he has worked for most major sci-fi sci and fantasy publishers and film companies worldwide. He is wrapping up a course for New Masters Academy. Hey, hey. So we're, we're excited to have you as part of our instructors. And he is a figurative painter, author, and teacher. He has authored several bestseller books, including Anatomy of Style, The Sci-Fi and Fantasy Art of Patrick Jones, among them. He's also authored Figures from Life, Drawing from Photos, Solving and Interpretation, Sci-Fi and Fantasy, All Painting Techniques, Sci-Fi and, pa and Fantasy, All Painting Masterclass, and Sentinels, a book about rogue AI. So Whoa. also... Uh, <laughs> Uh, far, uh, far, <laughs> far seeing into the future uh, as, as we are currently in the AI boom. Um, so with my introduction to Patrick Jones actually was his Imagine FX workshop in 2018. I ran into it on a, at a bookstore and I was like, wow, this is really amazing, right. fantastic work. So I'm happy to be here with you today and to have this conversation. Thanks, Manny. Can you remember which, which magazine it was? What was on the cover? It was Imagine FX, and it was a workshop on style. I think it was a two-parter. Oh, and right. one of it, and it, it had your, um, like a figure, like a sitting down reclining pose. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. That, that's, right. a, that's a deep cut, because that's like 2018. <laughs> so yeah, I had to go on like several, oh, several yeah. issues. That was back, a while so. back. Yeah. yeah, well, it's great to be here, Manny. Thanks for the introduction. One word of note, the wee woman's called Kathy. That's a hanging offense, oh. Katie. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> that aside, you know, yeah. I had to address that. She might be watching. Uh, <laughs> but <laughs> apart from that, yes, no, it's, it's brilliant. I'm here at the New Masters. I couldn't be made more welcome. Just love it. So glad I took the trip down to do this. I really am. So I want to thank the New Masters for that opportunity. It's been great. And yeah, I'm here ready to take questions, uh, discuss any, any, everything's on, on the cards. Don't feel like there's a, you know, you can only talk about this or that. You wanna know how to sharpen a pencil? You wanna know how to break into the industry? Anything at all, just ask your questions. I'm here to listen. All right, so uh, a word on that. We had some submitted questions, which we'll get through. Uh, and we'll also be paying attention to the chat throughout this session. It is a two hour long session. I understand you'll be doing a little bit of a, uh, of a demo for us. Is that correct? Uh, I was just going to well? draw anything really, just yeah. uh, with, question, with questions in the background. Uh, can, uh, they, can the students see my screen or my drawing board now? Can they see that? We will in a moment. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, I'll talk about so that when it comes up. We, we see it now, but um, we'll, first I wanted to ask um, yeah. a couple of questions and then we'll get, we'll get going. So uh, I kind of want to start from the beginning. Um, so were you artistic from a younger, from a young age, or was it something that you kind of grew into? Like, uh, no, I was, I, that's all I wanted to do. So it wasn't something that happened by chance. I don't remember even an incident where I went, this is, I want to draw. So I was always drawing. But I do <laughs> remember an incident where I went, I want to be a fantasy artist. I very clearly remember that. Because I wanted to be a Disney artist. 
Uh, because, you know, when you're a kid, that's what you see. You see Disney. So I wanted to be that. And then I saw Marvel Comics. John, Jack Kirby was, was terrific. But there was one artist in particular, he's practically unknown now, and he was called Steve Ditko. And Steve Ditko showed how to draw Spider-Man. But the irony is that he showed how to draw Spider-Man the opposite of how I would draw today, which was to grid it out. And in each mm -hmm. little square, you would have you know, the ear, and then the other square, you would have the eye. And you'd, you'd copy each square, and at the end, you have a drawing. So to me, that was magic. That's how Steve Ditko showed how to draw, but I'm pretty certain he, did, he didn't draw like that because his drawings of Spider-Man were so gestural, it would be impossible for to get gesture out of that squared idea. So that was a weird thing. So I got a false start and thought you had to draw with squares. I'm just gonna take this here piece out because I'm getting the neck off. There we go, I think that's better. So yeah, it was Steve so, yeah, Ditko. Did, did I absolutely I loved his work. I loved how Spider-Man had those curved legs, legs and stuff. It was just amazing. I'm getting a double, double, double echo. Do you think everyone's getting that? It might just be us. No, oh, never mind. Didn't we're, Discord too. Yeah, we're getting a little bit of a double echo. Stand by for, for a moment. Technical issues. In the old days, you used to put a test card up, it would go beep. <laughs> <laughs> My favorite's the, the Simpsons, like, the technical difficulties. And it's oh, like yeah. a donkey kicking uh, the yeah. cameras. So. I wasn't here in the Patrick, can you try saying something? Sure. Streams of consciousness, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6. I'm not hearing the problem anymore. Right now I'm not hearing many. Not hearing many. <coughs> can, can you hear me now? Yeah. I no can. echo? Okay. Yeah, I can hear no echo at all. Okay. Yeah, so it's dead, let's, dead clear. Let's uh, pick up where. Hold on, I hear echo. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're clear as a bell, and I hear no echo, no echo at all. Yeah, we're good on the Discord end, so muscle through it. Not on YouTube. Yep, we can hear fine. <coughs> we're not on YouTube. Okay. All right. Uh, so you you were you were mentioning Ste Steve Ditko, right? Steve, Steve he, he Ditko. He was doing Spider Man with a grin. Yeah, D I K O. Steve Ditko. He was a w uh, an odd one. He was an odd duck, and a lot of us are. You know, we come from these isolated places, and drawing is where we find solace. And he found it in his world, and I found it in mine. And I'm hearing that double echo again. <laughs> See, one, two, three. Yeah, that's working. Should we go with that? Go with that idea? I'll keep talking? Yeah. So, yeah, Steve Ditko, he, he used a grid method, which is really, it's, it's an instructional tool. It got me into actually making marks. But they were the wrong marks for me. And so in this course that I'm teaching here, it's all about really breaking free of that technical aspect and becoming more gestural and, and more in love with the, the pencil and the marks they make, rather than the, the nuts and bolts being right there in front. So if you have a grid, you're already looking at the nuts and bolts. And so I, I like to draw and teach the way it feels most natural. And in that way, you've got more longevity. You, you never burn out because you're always enjoying drawing. You're enjoying the marks you make. You're enjoying the, the process of it actually touching down onto the paper and feeling that pencil move, which I'll do in a little bit and show you what I mean by it. 
And that wasn't evident in the Steve Ditko technique. And it's not evident in his drawings either. So it might have been a marvel conception for maybe Stan Lee <laughs> pushed him into doing it to show this is how you draw, but it certainly isn't the way they drew, and not the way John Buscema drew either. So, yeah, so I don't teach the side-side method, which I think is fantastic, and the grid method, which I think is fantastic. I teach a whole different end to it. The, the, my ethos is gesture first, then structure, but I have methods in place that aren't grid, but are more based on structure, which is a simplified form of anatomy, and then I add gesture to the end. So I start with gesture and end with gesture. And so if you like the flow of my drawings, that's the secret sauce right there. But we can't just say, you can go home now. <laughs> gesture, structure, gesture, close the door, the secret's out. There's so much minutia in, in between all of that. And that's what I'll be teaching in this course. So it's a terrific course. I'm really proud of it. It's got amazing collaboration in it because I, I fought hard for the models. I think having a, a great model is half the battle. I fought hard for Amanda and Rajiv and the new masters were on my side and they found these models and tweaked things around until we got them together. And you're going to see amazing stuff. You're going to see me direct the models as I would in real life. You'll see me collaborate with them, let them run with their story, how to not just draw, but draw with emotion based on prompts. You'll see a lot of stuff that I haven't seen in any other courses. And I wanted to put it all in here. And as I was working with Kel and everyone, I was always saying, this hasn't been done before. I've not used this before. Here's a question that people ask, but it's never been recorded. All of that stuff I'm putting in this course. So I think it's a, a great course for you to come in and, and have a look at. But uh, yeah, on that, I don't want to talk too much. I'm, a, I, I'm so, so talkative. I'll take any questions that come based on that or whatever you've got. Oh, that, that's, that's incredible. That's fascinating. Uh, one, one thing, it, it kind of goes to the ethos of, of uh, New Masters, which is the gesture and the structure and yeah. construction. So it's, we're really glad to have you and, and have your, your approach. Uh, what uh, question? Um, so you, you've already spoken to when you want, you wanted to be an artist from the moment you were, uh, you were young. So, um, one of, one of the questions I was going to follow up with is, uh, did you go to London to train? Oh, or? well, that's a great, that's a great question. Cause I didn't train at all. So what I did okay. was I was always, I was talking to Amanda, the model about, I was bending the world to my will. So I was a world bully. I always went, I want this. I'm going to get that. And so. I wanted to be an artist at all costs. It didn't matter what. And I, you mentioned earlier, I grew up in the, what was called euphemistically the Troubles, which was just civil war. It's just, a, just rubble everywhere. And so the thought of being an artist was ridiculous. The thought of even having a job was ridiculous. You know, you wouldn't say to people, hey, how are you? You would say, are you working? That was the question, because hardly anyone was. So the chances of being an artist were just outrageous. And, you know, my, my father, and he was doing the right thing by me, was saying, give up that dream, it's ridiculous. Come and work with me on the building site. And he was a plasterer, and that's drywall in America. And the thought of 40 years of pressing gray into a wall for eight hours a day, I mean, I, they are heroes that do that. But you have to have the mind for it, and I didn't have the mind for it. I needed to create. And so I, I rebelled, and so that was my big rebellion. I said, Dad, I'm going to do it no matter what. And so off I went. Off I, went. Off I went to London on a boat <laughs> with a drawing board strapped in my back and just stood at the front like that in the, in the tundra of the Scottish winter blasting into my face, and I had no plan at all. I just turned up on those shores. I remember I fell asleep on the train in Glasgow, and it was so long and so warm in the train after that cold that it was like 16 hours or something. They did a bottleneck thing where they go everywhere before they go to London. And I woke up back in Glasgow again because I'd fallen asleep and had done a complete loop. <laughs> so the trip was, was horrific. But I got there. I went through a bout of homelessness and had many adventures. And you know, after all those trials, just a mere six, eight months later, I was working in Pinewood Studios 
and as a concept artist. So <laughs> follow your dreams. It, you know, that's definitely an advice that we can give to, to any and all upcoming artists. Like I personally, <laughs> my dad told me the exact same thing. Keep yeah. your, keep your um, uh, expectations more realistically, and, yeah. and yet here I am. <laughs> so <Yeah. laughs> he put looks at some of my work and goes, "Like, oh, this is not half bad." Yeah. So put your <laughs> dreams, put your dreams in the trash can. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I couldn't, oh, couldn't do that with my kids. So yeah, and that's. Uh, but to so you you didn't go to a school, but how do you go from? about a homelessness in London or in, in sleeping in a train to yeah. getting into a studio. Were you an intern? Were you no, were no. you studying at museums? Well, here was the greatest thing. Well, I already was studying. I, I studied like, if you could study like I studied, I, I teach at university now, and if the students t studied like I studied, they'd walk straight into a studio, you know? And some of them do. Some of them are absolutely brilliant. But I studied like this is the only passport out of here and I used to go to the Belfast City Library and just study every minute that I had available go down there on the weekends when everyone else was out playing soccer and I would just study so we had that one building we had the Belfast City Library it was filled with books so I didn't go and land on a train and, and have no skills you know I was already I was primed you know I'd done my own university the University of Patrick Jones <laughs> I'd done that so here's the greatest thing, is that I hadn't gone to art school, but I had a portfolio, a portfolio of drawings that I'd done. And that was the passport. And the amazing thing was that I never, and still haven't to this day, ever met an art director that said, what university did you go to? They always just said, let's have a look at your portfolio. And the minute that portfolio opened, I had a job, every single time. I think that the only time I didn't get a job when I opened my portfolio was at the very beginning when I was, it wasn't a job, I was looking for an agent. And so agent's books fill up really fast and you have to be at absolute pinnacle uh, and you're in London. And so I was in London. So in their view, I had many years left to go, but they give me very promise and encouragement. And like a guy said to me later, they said, come back, because <laughs> they don't say that. <laughs> they said, come back. I'd said, oh, they don't want me. I said, but they said, come back. So. I was learning from the guys there, because you meet your own kind. I, am, I met artists, you know, going to publishers, you meet an artist in the waiting room with you, and all of a sudden you, you find your kind, like glue, you know, you all get together. And eventually I was with my little tribe. It didn't take long at all, you know? They all congregate in the same places. And yeah, they told me if you get a call back from an agent, you're, you may as well just say you're, you're, your future is sealed. And they were right, they were right. Because the minute I, I was actually working as a professional artist before I had an agent. And the second I was working as a professional artist, I really had a pick of agents after that. So, you know, it's, uh, it's hard work, but it's not hard if you love it. So it was never hard for me. It was hard for those guys that were always saying, you have to do this and that and this and that. So they were, they had a, a pre-mapped path, whereas I had an organic path where I was talking about it the other day with, um, with Kel. I was open to being flotsam and jetsam. That stuff that rolls past the sailor's boats, maybe it's a little something of worth floats by and you pick it up. And so I had that mindset of something just floats past, I'll grab onto it. And it was greeting cards. I got a guy says to me, there's a job here, greeting cards. And I had no interest in it. But I knew that it was better than the building site that I was on. I was just working on the building site. So I was doing a lot of that. But my big break was when I got a book jacket from Orbit Books. When I got that and the difference in, because I was still working on the building side and taking little scratchy things as, as I could. So I was making a mark, but it wasn't a big mark. And then I got, a, I got a call back from a postcard that I'd sent out to all these publishers, Co totally cold. Just sent the postcard out with just the publisher on it, just the art director of. So try that today and, and just wait for the silence because nobody's getting back. But back then there was no internet, you know? And so, you know, and my, you know, my imagination of what happened that time, that card dropped on that art director's desk and it's called the slush pile. He sometimes opened them and it must've dropped on that desk and they went, well, look here. And the phone rang and I was at the other end of it. Hello. And it was Jeanette Diamond from Orbit Books. 
And she says, I just love what you've sent here. W would you be interested in doing three book jackets? I had no agent. It was just the work. That's all it was. One glossy little postcard changed my whole life. It was amazing. And I had that contract in my hand, never looked back. So there you go. There you go. Wow. It's as easy as that. <laughs> go, go do that. <laughs> and um, so my, my, my question, my other question was, um, uh, so you said you, you knew you wanted to be a science and uh, fantasy illustrator. Yeah. So do you think that part of growing up during the troubles was what endeared oh, you to fantasy and huge. storytelling? Because I grew up in Caracas, Venezuela, yeah. and I science fiction and, and fantasy was what I gravitated to. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Time. There's no doubt about it. And I know that the, the um, a lot of the Latin artists became Marvel artists, you know? So there was, a, there was definitely a big, for me as well, a big um, influence from the, the uh, also from the Spanish artists and from the Latino artists and the Filipino artists. They were all doing work for Marvel. So Marvel had a, they had a reputation for being cheap back then. And so, you know, artists in New York were making a fortune in advertising, so why would they do, you know, comic books? So the Filipino artists thought that was a great deal, you know? Oh, wow, that's a lot of money for, you know, just drawing pictures. And they were doing fantastic stuff. Artists, I remember Pablo Marcus was one, uh, Jose Gonzalez was one, and they were doing Vampirella and stuff. They were just amazing, and they lift, lifted the bar so high that I think that it encouraged people to do the comic book work for the love of it, because they were getting stale from the advertising, like I did. I, I did advertising. Burns you right off. And so we had these great artists come in. And the likes of John Buscema was an American artist, but he was so fast. He could make money. You know, he was so fast at doing it. Well, the likes of Barry Windsor Smith, an English artist who would have been influenced by those Filipino artists. He was doing all this intricate stuff. And apparently he was paid just a pittance, you know? John Buscema said, I'll not tell you what they paid Barry Windsor Smith because I'd be embarrassed for Barry Windsor Smith. He says, I'm not gonna tell you what they paid him because I'd be embarrassed for Marvel. So it must have been awful, you know? But yeah, it was Marvel Comics that, that uh, really inspired me and changed my path from the idea of being a Disney artist, which I ended up being as well to be a uh, fantasy artist because it was the, very specifically the Savage Sword of Conan, num issue four with the cover by Boris Vallejo, and that just changed my life. I just went, what the hell is this? Oil paintings are in museums. Here's one on a book jacket, and on the inside cover it said, cover art by Boris Vallejo. And I went, are you kidding me? People are still painting in oils and making a living at it? And that's how I found out that there was a, there was a future. And I went, I'm gonna do that. There you go. I'm so glad that you bring him up because that was going to be part of uh, my, my next question. The oh, right. There one you of go. the things that New Masters does really well is reflect or point to our tradition artistically, and, and they do a lot of master studies during their courses. Uh, I don't know if you'll have any master, master studies during the course that you're developing, but could you tell us a little bit about what Frank Facetta and Boris Vallejo meant to you, and yeah. uh, what would a new, um, up, up and coming student uh, gain from studying those folks? I think tons. I think what happens is that if you go back to the days of Boris Vallejo and even me, you know, before the pre internet, if you went pre internet, there was a lot of learning how to learn. So when everything's available, you don't actually learn how to learn. I know that seems like a weird thing to say, but you, you almost imbibe mostly. There's so much stuff you're imbibing it. And so you're doing it by rote, you're repeating it. But you're not actually understanding how it was done. You're, like you'll see artists and they, they look like other artists and they look like other artists as well. And it's they're copying each other's style. And they're not really understanding it. They're not understanding the anatomy, which if you see like a Xerox machine or like three generational um, copyists later, they're drawing muscles that make no sense. You know, I won't name any names, but you know, there's, there's very famous artists that really can't draw. They embellish. And so when they get to a point where the anatomy's not making any sense, they, they over-render it. And they try and, you know, they try and confuse you with detail. 
And so for me, the greatest artists were the ones that could just put the least amount of marks down and you could still read it like John Buscema would do. So I think there's a lot of that. I think there's a lot of what's missing there. You want to go back a little bit and learn how to do it, not learn how to, to draw the surface. So we, we had a term for that years and years ago. We called it surface artists. It's so simple. And there was fluffy artists too. And they fluffed things around so you couldn't really understand what was going on. So basically, they the tried to hide their mistakes with details. So yeah, where the likes of Boris Vallejo, he had to learn how to learn. You know, it wasn't all the, the internet wasn't there for us to grab and pull from. He just had to go, how do I mix this color? Well, I better start mixing colors and see how that, that's, that didn't work out quite right. Whereas you might go online and go, here's exactly how to mix exactly that color. And you mix it and you go, well, there's the color. And that's really helpful. But if you're not doing it on the fly, if you're not mixing in the, a palette of mud and, and dabbing it on and working things out yourself, then you miss opportunities. You miss opportunities to have this purpley brown that was never told to you. It was never, sorry, I didn't see it mixed anywhere, so I don't know it exists. So learning how to learn has been lost, I think, a little bit. And that, once again, back to this course is what I do a lot. I, I dig deep into my pre-me and ask myself, what is it that you learned and was so hard to find? Can you dig that back, back out again? Because sometimes you forget what it is. Sometimes it takes something like this where a student will ask, and I'll go, oh, of course, yeah, and I'll, and I'll show it. And it's a revelation to them. But for me, it's so deeply ingrained now that I forgot it was a revelation to me at one point. So that's the, I think that's the main learning. If you go back to before the, go back before the internet, get into your time machine, go back before the internet, and learn how to learn. Uh, that's not really possible. Use your imagination. <laughs> but you'll get a lot of it from me. <laughs> well, I th I, we, we have a resident hermit <laughs> who does kind of like a social media cleanse, and he'll like, I'm going to retire to my cave and, and yeah. do studying and homework. So I think everybody could be a little bit more like Ross. In that yeah. case. Is it Ross? So that's, yeah, if that's, you say that's that, good to know. Yeah, if you say the student names as well, uh, you know, I might might have some of my students in the Discord there. I'll say hello to them. And also you know, the great thing, it sounds like I'm disparaging the internet. The internet's the greatest thing that ever happened. I mean, I, I'm I, I am growing so fast because of it, because I'm seeing I'm being more exposed to all the art in the world that you know, I've been all over the world and I always go to the art galleries, but I can't see it all. And so the, the internet's amazing for that. Otherwise, I'd have to have my Belfast City Library right next door to see all the stuff that's out there. So the internet's amazing. It's absolutely amazing. But it's like every amazing thing. It, it has a dark side to it. You know, we've got to keep in the, got to keep in the gray area there and, and take the good stuff and throw the bad stuff away. And there's, it's just like anything, you know. It has 90% it has nonsense and 10% gold. And it's finding that gold and not being distracted by the 90%. It's so hard to be, not to be. I've, I've burnt up an hour on the internet and went, what the hell just happened, you know? So I'm not the god of, oh, I say the, spend your time exactly this way. I've thrown it and burnt it away like everybody else. It's a, it's a dangerous business. But definitely, definitely, to come back to the question, learn how to learn. And when your, your head's getting frazzled, and you, you, you feel like you're just grabbing stuff but not understanding it, then just take a breath and ask yourself, why am I doing this? And you might get a better answer. Yeah, no, that's, I mean, the, the internet does have a lot of challenges like figuring out where to go and what to learn and, yeah. and what is good advice and what's uh, not so, so. Yeah. So, so. <laughs> you can, yeah, yeah, you can go, think, with bad advice, you can go backwards. I think if we boil that down into a simple sentence, it would be, Bad instruction is worse than no instruction. And good instruction is gold. That's, that's, the, that's the kernel of knowledge there. I could have just said that to begin with. <laughs> but that's what I'm thinking. OK. Uh, thank you. So um, let's, let's talk a little bit about your career and, and discipline. Uh, so as I mentioned in the bio, you're a figurative artist, author, concept art and illustrator and so one of the questions i had when i was looking at your your life and your journey is like how do you find time to do it all well geez i don't know i i don't know 
I, would, I often have this, uh, this science fiction dream where I can slow time down, and then I just have all the time to do it. But it always has, like all great science fiction, it always has that premise, well, who does this hurt? And it means I'm like 150, <laughs> and I'm only 20, you know? So it's not possible, but th it's possible to get the best out of yourself by just making boundaries and saying, you know, the internet's a, not a bad thing, but maybe set an alarm off if you're on for more than 20 minutes. Because if you look at, the, like I've had the statue, the head of David here by Michelangelo, and he created and finished that David, which is still revered today as the masterpiece of sculpture. He finished that by 28, and I think he started at 25. Now, if you think about that, you know, I teach students, and they're coming out of university at 24 to start their career. And Leon, or Michelangelo was just about to put chisel to that David at that point. And if I think, you know, we see Charlton Heston play, in, play him in the movies. Charlton Heston could have been his granddad, you know? This was a kid. This was a kid chipping away at that marble. He'd have been a very strong kid. He'd have been the jock of the class because he's banging away at marble all day long. But he was still a kid. You know, by today's standard, he's just coming out of his nest. And yet he finished David at 28. So how did he do that? No internet, no television, no radio, no cinema, no nightclubs. Well, maybe a tavern here and there, but basically, he would probably work 16 hours a day. 16 hours. His 25 by today's standard would have been 70. He's put in 70 years there of, of hard toil. So with that in mind, I, I would say set an alarm, and once you're on Instagram for more than 20 minutes, get off and start drawing. And don't, I turn off everything. I turn off the, the radio, television, everything. I'll put on music, I like that. And if a big event happens, you know, I'll have it in the background. You know, when, like I'll never forget 9-11. That was running all day. I even put mirrors up in my studio so I could see it. But it didn't stop working. I kept on working. So you've got to, you got to stay focused on where you're going, you know, no matter what the world's throwing at us, you know. The, the world's in turmoil at the minute, but, you know, I've got eternal optimism and we'll be okay. We'll, we'll be all right. We'll get through it. You know, we'll come out better at the other end. You know, I think America's a better place after that terrible tragedy. You know, it showed how people band together and stuff, you know. It's just an amazing, we have an amazing fortitude as people. And I think that art in itself is the biggest reason, I think, where we go ahead. We feel that there's something worth living for all the time. And art is the solace for that, I think. No, that definitely is my... Uh relaxing time well when when i'm done with the day i i, I, I uh, also hermitage to the studio <laughs> yeah <laughs> to my office and, and draw so yeah yeah if I, this so is shut out the, the noise the motivating aspect. yeah shut out yeah. the noise is the is the main takeaway there yeah absolutely okay so we have uh, some student questions we're going to go get to next um one question that we had is, is your course going to be drawing only or we'll also have a painting component? There's going to be, component. well, painting would take an awful long time. So what I've done is I've put together a movie where I discuss how I create a painting with examples of step by step in the painting, close ups, why, with some painting actually in it. I've got a little bit of footage of me actually painting and, and then I'll f finish it with, you know, the reason why the backstory, everything that, that works well to get me where I need to be with that painting, I'll discuss in the painting. So there's a little bit of painting in it. The main idea of this course is to show how I equate charcoal drawing with paint. And so while I'm teaching charcoal drawing, I'm actually teaching how to paint as well. And I'll discuss how the pencils that I use are equivalent to the brushes that I blend with. And of course, you've got blenders. I actually haven't used any blenders in it, apart from my thumb tissue and, and chamois. So I've got a little bit of, I call this the Vilpur chamois, because that's how I learned about it. I thought, that's a nice idea. You wash out a chamois, and then you use it as a blender. What an amazing thing. So I learned from the New Masters Academy. I'm a life member. I think I was one of the first. The second I saw it, I, I bought it. 
So you can tell I really value the U Masters Academy. I didn't get shoehorned in here, you know? When I heard the call, I went, the sun's out, I'm, I'm there, you know? Would you like to come down? I'm at the door, that's me, that's me ringing the bell right now. That's how I felt when I was asked to, to come down to the new masters. So yeah, uh, there is that, there's the painting aspect, but most of it is about how to draw fantasy figures, how to imagine things and then to bring them to life and how to get the best out of that imaginary idea to begin with. Because everyone's got a great idea, but not everyone brings it to fruition. And I'm going to show you how to do that. Okay. Yeah. No, I'm definitely excited. I'm looking forward to to, to watching that that course. So, uh, related to that quest to that comment, um, do you lean on your writing on the visual aspect when you're drawing and painting, or is it something that are kind of kept separate? Yeah. And additionally, uh, are there spaces that you go to congregate with your tribe of <laughs> dual, yeah. dual class people, the, the ones that can draw and write at the same yeah. time? Or what, where do you normally That's a brilliant question. Who, who asked that question? That's a great That scholar. was Ross. That's the, Ross. Oh, you mentioned Ross before. Ross. Yeah. Yeah. Find your tribe. You've got to do that. And so, yeah, going back to it's not Patrick's down on the internet. Pa Patrick loves the internet. The greatest thing about the internet is finding your tribes. Once upon a time, that was, you had, look, you had to get on a train, fall asleep, end up in Scotland, all of that. Now you just go on to Instagram and they're there, you know, it couldn't be easier. So find your tribe, that's the first thing. And try to be, I think this is missing a lot, try to go outside and meet the tribe. Try and actually go out and say, is there a tribe in my city? And I do this and go out and meet them. And you sit around, and it becomes a whole different world, you know? Instagram's one thing, but when you're sitting down with people and you're getting that minutia of thought back and forth and then you start to meld it and you grow as artists so fast. On Instagram, you can ask a question. It's not quite understood and you get an answer that's not quite what you expected because you asked a question that was misunderstood. And it can go on and on for ages. You can, you can talk in circles. And you see it, you see arguments that long on, on Instagram. Uh, 6,000 comments. In a, in a little coffee shop, it's not like that. You go, oh, I see what you mean, no, like this, and you draw it. You go, oh, what a great idea. And so you've expressed yourself in a second because you're in person. So I say, try and meet your tribe outdoors if you can. But this is great, Discord. I have a, my, on my Anatomy of Style course that I run, I have my students in there after the course, and they're on fire helping each other out. You know, Discord's brilliant. I think Discord's probably better than Instagram. Well, it definitely is, because you can engage so quickly. And I think you can take calls as well. I leave it for them, and I pop in every once in a while to say hello and see how they're doing. And they're just growing like crazy. And the great thing is that because they've all learned from me, they've got the same mindset happening, but they're growing their own style out of it, because my course is all about finding your own style. It's not about draw my style, it's about find your style based on how I find mine. And that's what this is as well. Because I certainly don't want a whole thousand little Patricks running around like this, and every time it comes up on the internet, say, did you, is that Patrick Jones? No, that's me, Ross. <laughs> so I want everyone to have their own style based on what I teach. And for me, that would be just a grand thing to be sitting in an old people's home and just rocking back and forth with a pipe. Yeah, I taught him that. Well, I don't smoke a pipe, but that's what I, my dream is that. My dream is that, that I have helped someone step outside of my realm with the skills that I hopefully have put toward them and they've grown with and become their own people and have their own individual styles. I forgot what the question was, but that's where I went. Yeah, you, do we? No, yes. no that, that, is, that is uh Good way to answer the question, yes. Yes, it was yeah. the answer to the question. Go out and meet yeah. your, your own time. And Yeah. Now, w this is from Veronica. We had a question about, you, you mentioned meeting your own tribe and, and being with like-minded people, but are there any hobbies or activities that are not drawing related that has helped you create art? Yeah, I think, I think working out really helps. 
You know, if you're in the gym and you're doing like, uh, let's say overhead pulls or something like that, and you can see your serratus engaged, it's not like in the anatomy models. It's different, it's not as even, it's not as simple as that. And you go, oh, and then you can see the muscles move, and that's a bit of what we're gonna do in this, in this course as well. I'm gonna, we're gonna have a live model, and I'm gonna show their muscles move onto their skin. And you can see where the scapula wa was and where it is now, and how the skin didn't quite come with it, because that's floating on top. So with an, an anatomy model, the skin and the muscle are completely rigid stopped, like that. So you might imagine that the skin and the muscle are somehow always in the same spot, and they're not. And each muscle is changing its shape as well. It's, it's engaging with the, sh with the muscle next to it and crushing it, especially here on the neck with the sternocleidomastoid. And the trapezius, you know, as the neck turns, you get these wrinkles for that reason. And the wrinkles of the skin suit engaging with those two muscles which are crushing and squeezing each other like a python and changing their shape. And just on that one muscle, that sternocleidomastoid, you can draw that in a whole different set of circumstances and always get a beautiful rhythm with it, as long as you understand what it is. And if you're only drawn from an anatomy model, you'll probably just draw a pipe every single time because your mind tells you it's a solid pipe that doesn't change, and they change dramatically. So yeah, so working out, and I, I would say also as a lifestyle, I think you should always be active because, and I don't wanna be preachy here, this is a sedatory business. And if you're sitting on your plumps all day, just made that word up, <laughs> sitting on your plump, because I don't know what to say on the internet, all day long, you'll start to get, not so much like the out of shape business. If you, if you could be an oxen, some people are oxen and they're out of shape and they're fine for the rest of their lives. But you get tired and your mind gets tired. And so I find that if you're active, your mind is, is very fresh. And if you're not active, your mind gets very dull. So you might go, I don't have a half hour for exercise. I think if you spend a half hour exercising each day, you've gained three hours in cognitive recycling. And also you've learned to see muscles move. So, yes, I like to, no, uh, I, I like to I, do I that. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> I like I'm, to be I'm, physical. I'm going swimming lately and I'm being sore in muscles that I didn't even know I had anymore. Yeah, it teaches so, you your muscles. And the, uh, you know, the workout machines have the, anatomy diagrams like That's oh right. this is how you serrate it so it's a reminder yeah of how everything everything is in, in your body it's so, true yeah the gym is good for that the gym is and yeah. also study people in uh <laughs> how do i say this this it rings a minefield study people in tight clothes if you see someone in lycra pants it's a simplification of anatomy and so you can actually see the crease of the gluteus, for instance, when someone walks their leg back and then it becomes a different shape when they lay, walk their leg forward. And so you can see simple anatomy because it's been basically structured out. And that's what structure is. It's a simple idea of anatomy. So the gym does that too, you know, you can see, and the way clothes are cut too, it's not a coincidence that sunglasses or glasses are this shape. They have to fit onto the sagamatic arch. They have to sit into the orbital ridge of your eyes. And so clothes and glasses and all those things are, are built around anatomy. And so you'll see, I mean, even the shirt color, if you touch the back of your neck here, you've got your seven vertebrae. And if you touch the center here, you've got the pit of your neck. And one's higher than the other. And so that's how a shirt color comes down to the side like this. So that's a reminder. You see someone's shirt color coming down at an angle, it reminds you that the seven vertebrae is higher than the pit of your neck, which means you're neck is, is uh, shorter at the back and longer at the front, as far as this part's concerned. It's still longer at the back going up to the nuchial ridge. You'll have to watch the course, because <laughs> that sounded really confusing. And there's an example of, if you meet your tribe and you've got a pencil at hand, I could describe that very easily to you. I could actually do it. Can we draw? Uh, can yeah, we can, we, can, we can go ahead and draw. Let me, let me start collecting some of the questions from the Discord, okay. and then we can go back to the conversation. So.
I, I guess we can ask one more question since you're uh, getting ready to to draw a little bit. Oh, and I can this, answer. This will relate. Yeah. Uh, Manny, sorry, uh, I, can ans I can answer questions while I draw. That's probably the easiest yeah, thing for okay. me anyway. So I can just keep answering questions. Okay. So we do have a, a question that will relate to the, the drawings we might be able to do today. Yeah. So we have somebody from James Carmargo. I'm sorry if I'm butchering the name. Uh, he is struggles with foreshortening and the overlapping of forms and constructions. So do you have any advice and recommend and, and could you talk a little bit about that or demonstrate it yeah absolutely i the strange thing about foreshortening is when you start to learn to draw it's hard to break out of the you know eight heads high method and the riley method where you're drawing something straight ahead of you like that and it all makes sense and you work hard at it and you can see oh that head comes down to the nipple, comes down to the navel, comes down to the crotch, and you go, I've got this now. If you turn two heads on their side, you've got the shoulders. I've got this, you know? And all of that is incredibly important. But then what happens? You walk into a life draw class, and a model just drops into your foreshortened pose right away. And you go, well, I can't measure heads here. But the great thing is that through mileage from lots of drawings and from doing that to begin with, learning how the body is broken into parts that you can equate to. You can say that this head is the same as, you know, you can turn it on its side and say that's the waist of a female figure, one head. You can do that. But at the end of the day, when the foreshortening comes in, all that goes out the window. But the greatest thing happens. If you learn to break away from the structure part and engage in the gesture part and find the rhythms through the structures and how they, they run through and always end up in some serpentine point, then you've completely taken all the academic stuff that you've learned and twisted it and bent it into a new dimension. So if you're dropping plumb lines down, if say you had the standard figure and then someone moves like this and you go, where do I place things now? Well, you can drop the plumb lines from the nose and maybe it lands near the knee and that helps a great deal. But better than that for me is the foreshortening. So the thing that you fear the most is the thing you love the most at the end when you've done all your nuts and bolts, all your, all your structural mnemonics. Once everything falls into place, you'll start to see clearly that these things aren't necessarily up and down and left and right, but they're in a rhythm, and you can link them like that. You can link them with rhythms and start to find this moment. And then you can throw all that stuff away and go, I have the, the freedom that I've never had before now to chase these rhythms through this figure and draw something so beautiful and some, so fluid and so natural that I don't ever want to draw anything but a foreshortened figure again. <laughs> so the answer is, you know, well, come with me on this. You know, I'm sure there's a lot of new master students there that are going to see this course. Come with me and see how that, how that plays out. It's a, an incredibly complicated answer to a question that really needs many, many hours of you know, looking how it works, watching how it works, and the minutia of change in the idea as you flow, which is impossible, really, to answer with a question. I, I could run a thousand words off here and still not give you the answer. A big answer would be that as things come forward, they get shorter, foreshortened. If you were just working with line, a thicker line will always appear to be in front of a thinner line. So you get thicken your lines as they come forward and make sure the thin ones are behind. And that way you've got an idea of distance. But apart from that, you would have to watch me draw and come along for that adventure, which is all here. And it sounds like I'm trying to say, I come with me only and see this, but I've got lots of free content as well on my YouTube channel there. You can go and have a look at it. But I think with this course, we really get into that a lot because I'm trying very hard to foresee questions like that one and really dig deep. I will talk my head off as I'm drawing in, in this class, which I've already done. So I hope that answers some of the question. And also tone. If you're working with tone, most of your contrast is in the front and less and less as you go back and it'll feel like a distance as well. Yeah, that, that really answered the, the question. OK, uh, we have a question from the Discord server. Uh, will you be having a section in the course on how to analyze works from artists such as uh, Frank 
Mr. Setter. Who asked that question? That was, was that Kel? Al F. No. Yeah. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And I'll be doing a little bit more of that today. Yes, I've already done a little bit on the lineage. You know, like Frank Frazetta wasn't born in a vacuum. You know, we go, wow, it all started there. There was before Frank Frazetta, and there was before, before, and before. And before Frank Frazetta, or at the same time as Frank Frazetta, was Roy Krinko. So I'm going to talk a little bit about Roy Krinko. And before both of them was Norman Lindsay, an Australian artist, who I confess I didn't know who existed until I went to Australia. And then realized that I loved this work so much, it reminded me bizarrely of Frank Frazetta. And it turned out that Frank Frazetta was introduced to Roy Krinko. And Roy Krinko had introduced Frank Frazetta to Norman Lindsay. So I went completely right around like a boomerang and found out that Frank Pizzetta was influenced by Norman Lindsay. So I found Frank first, and Frank found Norman Lindsay first. So I'm going back through that lineage, and I'm going to go past Frank Pizzetta and look at Jeff Jones, who I think is, in many ways, he took what Frank Pizzetta had and, and, and took it further without being a replica of Frank Pizzetta. And I think he's a perfect model of how to learn from a master and become yourself become your own master, and then influence someone else to do the same thing. So yeah, there's going to be lots of that. I've already uh, wrapped up some drawing on top of Norman Lindsay to show you how I think Norman Lindsay saw things. But going back to that premise, learning how to learn, I've learned how to learn so much that I can now look at other artists and go, I think they learned how to do this by doing that. And so I draw on top of Norman Lindsay and say, I think this is what Norman was thinking. Because I put a picture up of Norman Lindsay, he's quite a wallflower. So if you've seen Norman, you go, that's not an outgoing person. So he asked me, he had to go in deep to find things, I think. He wasn't the kind of guy who go out drinking in clubs. But I think he had a frolicking time at that big mansion of his down in the Blue Mountains. Uh, there's a movie called Sirens, if you want to check it out. It's about Norman Lindsay. And it's not a great film, but it has Hugh Grant in it. So you'll like it for that with the floppy hair. It's great. And Sam Neely is always brilliant. So yes. So yes. Okay. Uh, we have another question. Will you be building characters in the course? Will it be some char character design? I think that might be. Yeah. Yes and no. It's mostly about the figure and the fantasy figure and how to create fantasy worlds. So you're creating characters. There's no doubt about that. You know, the main character we've built here between us. You know, I'm not alone in this collaboration here. I I sought. Amanda Achinot because I thought she was brilliant. I could already see she was a Frank Frazetta model. And so we talked and we discussed story and she grew the story. And so we're, we're creating characters that exist already, Perseus and the Gorgons. And there was a moment when I said, you know, I said to Amanda, remember the, the snakes in her hair, she, he doesn't understand. He doesn't understand Perseus that these snakes are supposed to be seductive. He sees them as horrific things. And so while she's doing this, the snakes are doing that too. And he's repulsed. And so he can't believe, she can't believe that he's repulsed by this thing where in the Gorgon world, that's the most seductive thing you can, you can be as a woman with snakes on her hair. But Amanda took it so far, you know? I said, so there's the premise. And she, she went in there and she, she pulled off her veil and the snakes come out, you know? And she started to hiss. And it was terrifying. We were all scared. And she started crawling forward. And so I would have to give her further prompts. I'd say, Perseus is disgusted. He can't believe what you are. And now you're really furious at him. You're hissing. She starts to hiss. He's chopped your snakes off. Your sisters, the snakes, they're wiggling to the floor. You know, they're part of her, you know. She grabbed her head like that. The blood's running down her. So I'm doing all this. I'm doing all the art direction. And, and Amanda's running with the prompts. And she puts more into it. So, <laughs> if, you, if, you can, uh, if you can hire Amanda, you're going to get some great shots. You know, you're going to get some great reference. We have all that reference of Amanda because Daniel in the background was doing amazing stuff. He was shooting off terabytes of, of still footage of that while we still had the footage of me directing that live. So you'll have me live directing the shoot and all of that. Uh, photographic stuff is there for you to draw from as well. And in between those shots, you'll get 
actions that you don't normally get in a, you'll never get in the life draw room because it's a moving set of stop motion photographs. And for me, the anticipation of the action and the reaction to the action is way more important than the action itself. And so when Amanda pulls back like this, that's a much more important an arrest in an image than Amanda just standing there with snakes, you know, or doing this with a hat. That pulling back and going forward and the frames in between, within those you're going to get amazing shots of physicality and how muscles move naturally. Whereas if you pose a model like that, they'll, they'll do isometrics, they'll hold their muscles stiff. They'll be stiffening the bicep and the tricep at the same time because they're becoming a statue. They're trying to, they're trying to get what you want. They'll move a finger here and they're just not, never going to be natural, not in a million years. Whereas we ran that footage, running forward, coming back, all the emotion in the prompts. It wasn't just, here's a story passage, see if you can work that out. I'm saying, he's coming forward now. She's running back. He hates you. You still love him. You want to kill him at the same time. All these emotions all coming out at once. You'll not get any better reference than that. The course is worth it for the reference. <laughs> the reference is amazing. It's, so we stand to also gain a little bit of a skill on art direction as well. Yeah, you'll get everything. Course, well, yeah, that's, that's right, Manny. The thing is that I want to show that I, the work that I end up with is not just like Frank put out, Frank Frazetta put out the myth that it just came to him, you know? I'm showing that anyone can do this. If they go through what I went through, which was, how can I make this better? How can I, I had, I always work with models and I always engage with them and I always got good, better shots that I thought that we can get in the books. And I thought, well, why don't they have such good shots in the books? They've got all the professional equipment. They were lacking one thing. They were lacking the passion and the thought of what do we want to do with these rather than this will work in anything, you know, someone drinking water. You know, you get lots of books of posed models, people drinking water and hammering the nail and stuff. That's all great if you work in advertising. But if you work in fantasy, you may as well forget that. I'm not going to change a cup for a gun. Someone's drinking water and they have a gun in their head. You know, it's just crazy. It's not going to work. And yet I see people try to do that all the time. So yeah, I, I've always used models. If you can't afford a model, you know, you find your tribe and you photograph each other. And even if you're wallflowers, it's the funnest thing you've ever seen in your life when everyone gets together. So, Go on, Manny. That was going to be my next question. So, so what advice would you give to somebody that wants to work with models? Like convincing someone to post for them or yeah, yeah. once they find their tribe or, or is it like more narratively like, I want you to think of the story the entire time, and yeah. you, you narr you're narrating the, the the events and the concepts to them. Yeah. What what would they? How should they approach the direction? Process? Well, first of all, if you if you find your tribe, it won't be long before everyone's saying, "I want to pose for this." It won't be long f before that happens. So it's one of the f most fun things I do when I teach in class is have the class come in on on uh, costume day, and they bring their costumes in, and they they're pirates and they fight each other and we set the photo shoot up and they laugh their heads off. Now these are the same kids that walked into the class on day one and found the corners of the room to hide in so they could never be seen again and hoping for the course to end so they could all go back into their bedrooms again and never be seen again. These are the same kids. And so once you get engaged in a story like that, and they come closer and closer to the front of the class and then they learn how to draw and then they start to talk to each other and I'll put them in groups and they become the noisiest, chatteriest things in the world, you know? They go totally from introvert to extrovert. So on costume day, they go mad. So it's the most wonderful thing, finding your tribe, getting your stories out there, getting back to the question, how do you ask someone to pose? They'll volunteer themselves. Volunteer yourself first. You know, what I always did when I had a model that I hadn't worked with for the first time, I would do the poses. I would mirror the poses. I would stand, I'd say, if you just stand like that, and then just come with me here like this and like that. And a, a lot of models even don't, are, are quite shy, you know? You'd be surprised at that. And then they start to do this, and they go, this is great. This is usually very dull, and now I'm getting the indirect. Usually just 
try and think of, you know, they're shopping or something. And now they're, they're actually in the workshop and they're engaged in it. So get engaged with it. Do little thumbnails. Show them to your friends. Say, here's what I'm going to do. What do you think of that pose? And they'll start changing things around. If you want a professional model, uh, they might seem out of your range, but they're not. If you think about it, if you go to your life draw class, that model has been hired by the life draw class. Now, they don't have a badge, like a cup or anything that says, life authority, I can now hire a model. They're just people that rang up and said, I need a model. And they say, well, what, how, you know, um, it'll cost this. It's, okay, I'll get back to you when I have 10 people. And so they get 10 people, and they know that you can afford the model. And that's great. And so n now there's 10 people that chipped in possibly as little as $20, as much as you pay on the door almost to go and draw a life model. And now you've got a life model. And you can all draw them. And if you chip in a little bit more, then you can photograph them as well. So they're not as expensive as you would think. A professional professional model, meaning like a catwalk model, is, is off completely out of the boundaries of, of uh, cost. You can't afford them. So in people's mind, they think supermodels, you get a million dollars, you can't afford a model. They're different models, and they're useless anyway to a fantasy artist. So I hired a prof professional model once, and she couldn't have any other poses but the, what you see on the catwalk. She's just totally no use at all. Just couldn't even get in the mindset. So actors are great. You know, actors are always looking for ways to perform further beyond. Amanda's an, an actor and a singer. You can find, go into the arts, your tribe's there. Go to the theater, they're there. They'll pose for you, and they'll love it as well. You know, it keeps them going, keeps them between gigs and stuff, you know? The art community, it's a small herd, but once you become part of it, it seems like a lot of people, and a lot of people want to work with you if you're good. It's all part of the tribe. All right. No, uh, no. yeah, I think uh, the Discord server serves uh, a big, it's a big service for the art community. I think I don't think anybody could have imagined we would have where we were going to end up in 2020. Yeah. So it's it's this is a really exciting aspect of the new masters community and and finding our tribe, but. But local is also very important, right? So, yeah, so locals going to your local meetups. Yeah, it's, it might seem like it's impossible as well. Like for instance, I'm in Brisbane, Australia, and it's about as on to the, to the, you know, the first look, it's about as on artistic as you can imagine. You're not gonna find any artists there, right? And I looked around sports bar after sports bar after sports bar, cricket, football, where's the arts? You know, there's a, little, there's a gallery with a few paintings in it go there. Suddenly you see people walking around. Now you're in the cafe. You know, there's that. But they put on Supernova. It had never been there before. I thought, are they going to get five people to this? You know? It was the biggest event Brisbane had ever seen. Because all those kids I talked about in their bedrooms that go to the corners of the room came out in their thousands. And it became an event that's here every year. And now they're blocking off traffic for it. They've got a huge stadium for it. All those people existed in a place that looked like no one existed. They just came out. You've got to find them. So, you know, you can make yourself a little, like the Discord group there. My students are on there now, and they're, they're just engaging every single day. Some of them are in South Africa. Some of them are in, uh, well, a lot of them are in Los Angeles, I hear, around California. Seems to be the hub of artistic, uh, you know, clumpiness. So if you live in California, you're going to find your tribe very quickly. If you, if you are in Brisbane like I was, and you think there's no tribe there, you'll be really shocked to find they're there as well, just like they are in California. They're just not so visible because you don't have Paramount Studios and Warner Brothers. Well, we actually do have Warner Brothers in Australia, but you don't have them in Brisbane, but you've got them in every street corner in LA. You go into Los Angeles, all you'd be doing is bumping into actors and artists, you know? But you'll find them yeah. you'll anywhere, find them. everywhere yeah. in the world. Art is so, it's so necessary. We have to have it in our hearts. And even like take my dad, for instance, you, you would say there's a man that's been a plasterer all his life. He wouldn't have any interest in art. Loves the movies, loves comic books, loves novels. He loves the arts. But in his mind, he doesn't think that's art, you know? It doesn't, the first thing that comes to mind is, is not art. It's just entertainment, which is art. 
So, no, I I agree. I mean, we're we're, we're surrounded by art. Uh, a lot of the the human experience is doing something creative and artistic when we're not having to to go yeah. to work and do our nine to five. So, for those folks that are just starting out, and either as adults or even young teenagers like that that are watching today, do you have any specific advice that you might give them? Besides finding your tribe, um, more and also specifically, like the frustration when you start learning, how yeah. do you deal with that? Yeah, the frustration of learning is well, as it is in this question, it's it's frustrating. Uh, what I would advise is the great advice that I just heard uh, personified in the drawings of Steve Houston and in the way he speaks and spiritualizes everything is to draw and a little bit every day, and that's a little win. That's a Steve Houston maxim, a little win every day. And I always had that, but I didn't, I didn't understand what it was, and it was basically doodle. So if you doodle, you're drawing. And I think doodles are actually more important than the actual drawing, because there in its essence is the love of it without the pressure of it. And so while you're doodling, you're actually really enjoying it, and you might just say that's nonsense, but it's not. And so I always drew figures of eight. Can I draw, when, when we come to the drawing aspect, I'll show you what I mean by that. We'll do streams of consciousness. But when I'm doing the streams of consciousness, you'll understand what I'm talking about right there. So draw every day, but don't go, I have to set up a drawing board and this and that, and now I'm ready to go. Just have a piece of paper, a little drawing pad with you and a pencil and a, and a, an elastic band. Have that in your coat every day and doodle. And the minute you start to doodle, you want to draw something. Maybe you'll start drawing a little face. But don't say, oh, I have to draw a body now, you know? Because then you're getting into that pressure world again. Draw what you love. love to, learn to love the pencil, which I'll talk about a lot. Learn to love the pencil. And then eventually that pencil will grow into better doodles and more gestural drawings. And if anything, a doodle is a better start than a well, definitely, a better start than a structural idea. If you sit and say, I'm going to learn how to draw a head and an arm and a leg, they're just Frankenstein parts. If you doodle, and as I teach in this course, you can take a structure that's an ugly thing, and you can doodle through it and make a beautiful thing out of it. So doodle is a gesture. Doodle. Yeah. You know, I, I found that if you draw enough days, in a row, yeah. even if your drawings are not perfect, by a certain point, you're gonna have the itch, like you're gonna wanna yeah. draw. You're gonna <laughs> have like, oh, I haven't drawn today, I need to get it done. The, you will, today. that's exactly, it. that's so, what, very so well put, do, Manny. Five minutes in. It's very well yeah. put, and you, you just equate that to anything. You know, say you're an active person and you haven't exercised for three days, you'd be just going crazy to get out and do a run, mm -hmm. and that's exactly what happens. If you draw every day and then you stop drawing, You'll be itching to draw. You'll, you'll have to do it. And then there you go. You're in Nirvana. You're an artist. Okay. Yeah. Um, draw every day. <laughs> yeah. Draw every so day. Even, if it's, even if it's just two minutes. Yeah. Even if it's just yeah. a, a scribble. You can do a lot in two minutes. But we you have can do a ton. Gesture timers for two minutes. Yeah. 30 seconds, five minutes. So. In fact, I would so say. You can do a lot of stuff. Yeah. yeah. I would say, Manny, actually, I would say that if you drew. 10 minutes every day as opposed to four hours once a week, I think you're a better artist at 10 minutes every day. That's what mm -hmm. I believe. Of course, if you can get an hour in every day, jeez, you're yeah. flying. Yeah, but that's it. You always have those 10 minutes, and then you're never off the ho you never fall off the horse. You're always on the horse. And so let's say you do 10 minutes every day, and then you do an hour on the, e on the weekend. You're an amazing artist if you continue to... to Call it a lifestyle, not mm -hmm. here's I'm going to do this and I'm going to be an artist. I'm an artist forever. This is a lifestyle. Okay. Yeah, no, I used to do uh, my one hour lunch break every, every day for quite a long time before, before I had to stop. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah it's uh, great, we it? have two more questions. Yeah. We have two more questions. And I think we, we can start drawing whenever you're ready. But we have okay. a question from Rebecca. Um, on regarding his, you sorry, it's a little bit of echo, so I gotta. Yeah, I can hear it. Yeah. 
So the question is about your all painting masterclass book. Uh -huh. uh, well, he, she wonders if your process has changed since that book, and do you still use solvent free oil yeah. when he does when you don't when you do layers of glazing, or do you use the same liquid? Liquid ratio I, in each I've layer. Yeah, I've stopped using liquid and I'm using Galgit light, so it is always always moving forward. But since that book, Rebecca, I haven't changed. No, I've, I'm still doing one third walnut oil, one third Galgit light, light, and one third Gamblin. I think it's called Gamblin. It's an American product, so it always trips me up, and I've only had it for the first time. And that's the solvent. Is that right, Kel? Yeah. yeah. So I use that one third ratio, and it's the best ratio and combination of things that I've ever ever used. It dries quickly, and the Galgit light is much more fluid than the liquid, which goes all gloopy in the bottle. It's still a great thing. I mean, if you, if you have it, use it. But I've stopped using it uh, because what happens is that every time you take the top off, a bit of it dries. And by the time you're, you know, two months into it, half of the bottle's already dried up and you have to poke a big stick through it to get to the bottom. So you're not really getting a cheap, uh, you know, more product for your money because half of it's unusable. So the Galgit light is more expensive but you use all of it. It's always fluid. So that's, I still do that. The only thing that really bothers me is the linseed oil, because uh, it can self-combust on a rag and go into flames, and also it yellows with time. Uh, that's why I've dropped the linseed oil altogether and used the walnut oil. But be aware that the walnut oil is very slow drying. So if you are using turpentine, which I totally wouldn't use anymore, even though it's, it's up to you. If you're working in the outdoors, it's fine. If you're working in a small studio with the windows closed, I won't use it. So, because I'll just fall over. I'll just be too dizzy. So if you mix, if you come out of that, that uh, walnut oil and use something else, then the drying time will be faster. But the walnut oil is just beautiful. It's really beautiful. So yes, Rebecca, long story short, I'm still using that, but it doesn't mean I'll be using that next year. But for now, it's the best I've found. And if you carry it on using it the rest of your life, it'll still be the greatest thing ever until the next greatest thing. So I'll let you know when the next I'll greatest thing happens. All right. Thank you. Next up, we have uh, Marquis. How do you suggest for a student to transfer their academic skills like light size, observation, and still life into drawing figures from somebody who hasn't done them in your approach? Yeah. Well, all those skills you've learned are still great. So you're already ahead of the game. So it's not like if you've learned those skills, you throw them away and go, I'll start again with Patrick's method. They're brilliant. I use them. I use them. I mean, you'll see me measure Amanda using heads. The great thing about it is it's very accurate. And so you're going to sacrifice some accuracy using my method. But I've always found that a gestural drawing is much more interesting and beautiful than a solid structural drawing that's actually perfect. There's so many of them that after a while I get a bit, you know, phased and dazed and not even thinking about them anymore. I just go, that's an, you actually say the word, there's an academic drawing, isn't it good? But what takes my breath away is when I open a book and there's a Jeff Jones gestural drawing or a, or a Gustav Klimt elongated figure or s something that's just not, it's just broken away from the academic rigid nature of things and become the artist's hand. And so, but I can still see like, I'm looking at Elias stuff in here and he's from the academic school, but he's got something more in there. You know, he's got life in it. He's, he's just bending the, the academic a little bit. I wanna bend it even more and get every once in a while, you wanna fall flat in your face. There's no doubt about that. I mean, probably nine times out of 10, but once you hit 10, that's it, there's a drawing that people will always come back to and say, I love that drawing, I love that drawing. And I can see it in just a handful of, of artists. So it's a rare thing, but it's attainable when you start to let fly, let that gesture fly and break away and come back to the academic when you need it and break away again, like a wave back and forth. So gesture, if there's too much of it, your figures are going to fall apart and look like jello. But with structure, your figures are always going to look rigid. So you've got to get some gesture in there. It, it, it's, it's just imperative. Otherwise, you just, you're, just drawing the, you're just drawing the anatomical models, really, as life figures. 
but it's a great method. All that side size stuff, all that academic stuff that you've been taught, it's invaluable. Let's see where you can go with it now. All right. Uh, we have another question from Dylan Dixon. Um, what do you think is the best way to learn how to draw fantasy creatures? What process do you find works best? Well, once again, we were talking about that yesterday. Mm -hmm. And let's take the scapula, the scapula that works our arms, okay? So how many times have we seen a four-armed creature where the arms are just stuck on the side of the body and they look that way? And the reason they look that way is because you've just moved the arms only, not the mechanism that moves the arms. So you've stuck arms onto the side of a body and there's no scapula there. And without the scapula, those arms can't go backwards and forwards. And so you're stuck with the idea that you can always only show these four-armed creatures from the front. Otherwise, you're caught because you're going around the back and there's no scapula. You know, and you go, oh, those are stuck on arms. And you can see them in old, old movies. You know, you, they make monsters like that and they move the monster and you can see the, the two extra arms moving by themselves. And that's kind of what happens if you don't understand your anatomy. And so the way to make up fantasy creatures is that if you're going to add arms, understand how arms work and the, me the mechanics that work the arms, and then move them down the body to, to add all of it in. It's, it's tricky, but it's a wonderful game to play. And you'll, you'll see me through this play lots of games. The contour game, the stiff contour game, the simple contour game, all these games to run your imagination off of the, what we have in real life into the fantasy world. So yeah, learn your anatomy is the main thing, but let your imagination run, and don't be frightened. Don't be fearless. Be fearless. It's only it's only pencil on paper. The worst you can do is make a hole in your paper. <laughs> or, or break your pencil. Or break your well, we broke we, well, we've broken so many. Well, <laughs> there's another thing. Have six have six pencils sharpened while you're drawing, especially if you're doing a demo. So we have a question from Kush. Um, having written a book about rogue AI, how do you feel about the art AI and the AI boom? <coughs> who's uh, that trying to start a war? The, who's starting a revolution? <laughs> <laughs> who's, who's, is, who's that with the torches and the pitchforks? <clears throat> well, <laughs> I, because I've been through so many revolutions, and let's, let's just understand this. It's not going away. Okay, so you've got to learn to live with this. It's just in every science fiction horror movie, you've seen that. Once they build the robots, they're not going away. Okay, so you've got to learn how to tame them, how to, how to work alongside them. And if they kill you, then you just weren't paying attention. So pay attention. So what did I do when I saw AI? I went, okay, well, that's, that's not good, is it? That was my first reaction. And then I saw some artists on the internet really in terrible grief because they had prompted in their own name and got an artwork back better than they could do themselves. And that was devastating to see. You know, the, the artist I'm trying to think of at the minute, brilliant, brilliant artist, did the cover of Ray Bradbury's book. Uh, I can't remember, and it's not coming to mind at the minute, so I'll stop thinking about it and then it'll come to me. And that's another strategy as well. When you're over texting your mind, just don't try and find that thought. If you're gonna have a good conversation, don't try and find the perfect word, just go with the next word. And art's a lot like that too. Dave McKean, see? <laughs> you, you saw it in action right there. So he did, his, he prompted his own name, got an artwork out that he thought was better than he could have done. But it wasn't. It was only better than he could have done because he really did do it. He prompted his own name in there. So the AI had learned to be like him. And so that artwork would have come out later from him, but not at that speed. That was the, the true terror. So I went into AI art, and I burned through about 4,000 prompts. I won't call them artworks, because they were just prompts. And I saw how it worked, and I, one example I've said before, I, I typed in a bird's eye view of a spaceship, and the spaceship came out with a big bird's eye on the front of it. So we're not talking to an intelligent thing. It's, not, it's artificial, it's not intelligent at all. It's just an artificial idea of, you know, you, you know zeros and ones. And so I thought, okay, right, this isn't a smart thing. As someone very cleverly said before, a cockroach is more, is, is, has got more intelligence 
than the M2 chip in the Mac. Because an M2 chip in the Mac, if you throw it in the fire, it'll just burn, whereas a cockroach will walk around the fire. So that, that's how I think of AI. AI only appears to be intelligent. Now, I burned through 4,000 artworks, and I started to realize that you can actually manipulate this to bring out something really, truly beautiful. And I thought, no, that is scary. But when I looked at, after me as an artist, burning through forethought, and it was draining. It was, it was not fun. It was not fun. It was fun at the beginning, and then it was very clearly starting to become work, and then it was not fun. And then I started to see how it worked, and it became exciting again, and then I saw that it was repeating itself over and over. If I, put, if I typed in alien landscape, something beautiful would come up, but I noticed a little artifact that always appeared, because I was going through them really fast to see what the limitations were. And I saw an artifact, and I realized it was the alien from the spaceship alien in the Nostromo. It's, it thought I was asking for a, an alien landscape created with, all it could understand is that's what alien is, the title of a movie somewhere that it harvested and stuck an image down that came from that movie, and it was that. So all the rocks started to look like that spaceship band in the rock. So every rock had a curve to it and then a long point to it. And I went, oh, I see, I see. So we're at the limit now. We're at the limit. I found the limit. Even though they say they pull from billions and billions, they're only really using the best or the most average of all of that. And so Alien, everyone knows Alien, millions and millions of hits, billions of people have seen the movie. That's what comes up first and continues to keep flashing up in the AI. So at the end of it, I went, okay, well, I think this is not as scary as it's first seemed. Sure, it's good for junk art, but there's always been junk art. You know, if someone's, if an advertising agency says that's good enough, it's good enough. So, yeah, it's going to be really great if you're under pressure. And I'm sorry, I didn't mean junk art. There's some of us really beautiful. But what I mean is clip art. That's what I meant to say. So clip art, it tells a story. It's, it's done enough to just engage someone for five minutes and they've sold the product. So clip art. It'd be great if you are a graphic designer and you can do, you know, bang 20 of them out. And now you've got, it's, it's good for those guys. It worked for them. As a fantasy artist, I don't think it's any use at all. I think it's nice for backgrounds and it gives you a good color palette right away. I think it's really brilliant for that. So if I, if I was going to use it as a fantasy artist, I would use it for the color pal palettes. I think their palettes are amazing. And so right away, so right yeah, go ahead, Manny, sorry. That's interesting, because I had nothing but orange, yellow gradients on all yeah. of the prompts that I would put in. Is that so right? That, yeah, so I used, I used my journey for like my yeah. 25 credits, and then I was like, this is not fun. <laughs> I, I agree with you, because it yeah. takes away the entire um, part that I like, which is creating, yeah. and I'm just typing again, so I'm back at work. Yeah, well, that's, <laughs> that's exactly what... Um, what somebody said, I think it might have been Dave McKean, it said, it's called mid-journey, but it's an oxymoron because they've taken the mid-art and the journey because all you get is the end. You're nowhere near the middle or the journey. There was, has been no journey. So that's the problem with it, and that takes us right full back to that first question, Manny. What can we learn from the previous artists? You're learning how to learn. AI doesn't teach you how to learn at all. It's just given you exactly what you hope for. And it's candy. It's candy, yeah. So here you go. <laughs> like Have you're not eating your vegetables. That's it. You're not getting any vegetables. You're getting no protein. All you're getting is the sugar. And at the end of the day, that's why you got a headache. You know, it's just it's just mind numbing. But that said, I don't wanna be I don't wanna be the uh, Luddite that goes and breaks up the, the machines because it's taking away the jobs of the textile worker. I don't wanna do that. I mean, I, that'd be the wrong thing to do. But I think you've got to be very aware of what it is. Go back in time, learn how to learn, and then take that as a tool and throw it. Because I was, when I did those artworks at the end, I did a bunch of artworks and I looked at them and I went, well done, Patrick, that looks like your style. And then I looked at the billions and billions of rolling artworks being spat out every second. I mean, every, it was terrifying. There's billions of artworks. And I looked at my art and I went, I've only just been doing this today and it's a million times better than all of this stuff that's just churning art because none of it had an artist's eye in it. It was just, you know, a million, 
that's, that's a minefield. A million chimpanzees typing on a million typewriters for infinity will create yeah. the works of Shakespeare. Yeah. But I haven't got the time for it. <laughs> yeah, I think that's also, that's another thing, like developing the taste as an artist. Yeah. That people in a Discord server talking to an AI yeah. are not going to dedicate the time to. Yeah. But I'm so, not at the same time. I'm gonna. I've yeah. got an open mind. I'll watch it. Yeah. And someone said something very interesting that made me stop and think. Patrick, you are. You know, it's time for you to step back a bit and get off your high horse. Someone said, what if you never had the ability to draw at all? Or what if you have no hands or something? Think of the pleasure those people are getting from putting those prompts in and creating art. And I had to sit back and say, you know what? It's for those people, for sure. That is a wonderful, wonderful outlet for someone that has no artistic uh, way to express themselves. So it's brilliant for that. So I'm open. If only they had compensated the artists, I would have went, bravo. This is an amazing new toy. It's, that's the only problem, is that they're stealing from artists. That's it. In my mind, gold, like the blazes. But if you're taking food out of the mouths of artists, then I think it's an awful thing. That's my, that's my political end of that, that yeah, discussion. I, I agree. <laughs> um, one can only hope that it at least inspires somebody to like, hey, I, I want to do this. I want to do this myself. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, we have uh, uh, another question. And uh, whenever you're ready, uh, Patrick, we can yeah. See uh, your streams of consciousness. Streams of consciousness. We'll, we'll, yeah. All right. But, but like I say, Manny, I can... This question... I, yeah, go ahead. It's from Oridan. As opposed to figurative art, not having a life model to connect with, Yeah. how do you approach the cartoon-like characters that you do? Yeah. Well, you know, I, lo I love drawing cartoons. And once again, <laughs> I'm a terrible spruker. In the course that I'm doing now, that's, that's a great insight right there to a mind at work. You know, asking that question, is someone learning how to learn, right? Because you wouldn't have a question like that unless you were really thinking deeply about it. So that was a great question. And in this course, I actually go into my cartoon work and describe why it's so fluid and why it's so simple, because it's based on complex. And so learning the anatomy, learning how to bend the anatomy, automatically leads you into cartoons. And that's why the cartoonists and the Disney artists go to life draw. Disney artists were paid a wage to go to life draw class because Disney knew how important it was to f keep the flow faster and more, and more expressive because they knew how the muscles worked and they knew how to simplify the muscles. So yes, I go into that, simplify, 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 and if it gets too simple, then pull back if you want a bit of realism or go even further and see if you can get right down to just line, just line and a dot, which a lot of artists end up with. But yeah, I've got a little bit of cartooniness going on in this, uh, this drawing I've got here. In fact, this is a good example of half and half, if we can have it on the screen. We got it on the screen now? So you can see here that I've taken all the detail out of Amanda's face here to get this almost cartoony feel to it. And excuse me, <coughs> halfway through I went into danger world and didn't like the hand that was in the, the reference. Now the reference itself is, is the photograph of a live model. So all the nuances, all the, the muscle, all the stuff that terrifies the life out of you when you walk into your life draw class is there. And your immediate go-to is to draw everything you see. And then it becomes even crazier because you think you're making a mistake with every mark you make. I had to change the hand here because I just didn't like the way the hand was working. And so the hand here is a whole different hand, but it's a cartoony hand. It's a cartoony face. But look at the rhythm, look at the movement and the, and the love that's in this. And the way we got there was through, let's have a look at a couple of the drawings from the course. So if we look here, let's find her. We can't show nudity, otherwise we'd show you the reference for this. So you'll have the reference as well. Let's see. First of all, let's show drawing the impossible. So at one point, there was a, there was a pose by Amanda who just pushed the boat out like crazy. So you might go, oh, I could copy that. That'd be, you know, I can do that. But if a life model hits that pose and you have no reference at all or no understanding of anatomy, 
that's like drawing the impossible. And that's why I call this drawing the impossible. Because when I was a, a young artist, this was the impossible for me. And first of all, when I saw the pose, I went, that pose is impossible. A life model can't hit that pose. But Amanda did. You know, we're seeing the front and we're seeing the back at the same time here. And, and this incredible torque as well. Amanda hit it, so it's not impossible. So we can pose the impossible. And I've drawn it, so it's not impossible to draw the impossible. So I called it that as a kind of joke term because it is possible. But at some point in your life, this is going to seem impossible. And it would have been impossible for me. I just didn't understand any of it. So I chose this pose. The second I saw it, I went, we're going live? No. I was a coward. I went, find an easier pose. And I went, no, what, Patrick? It's time. Draw the impossible. Draw under pressure. Now, I can see down here, there's a little bit of my streams of consciousness. So I'm doing this all the time. And now I can go up here and draw the impossible. So when you get into the course, have a look at the reference for this. And, you, and you'll see under here, you can't see it quite. But because we recorded this, this was originally a pencil drawing. And then I went back over the top of it again. And by going over the top of, the, of it again and showing you the parts as simple structure, then you're in cartoon world. You're starting to understand how to draw cartoons. So the answer is, just like the Disney artists, you go in to the life draw room and you learn how to draw from life. This is from a life pose. And then you learn how to break it down into different parts. So you'll see me draw this live. And you can see all my notes here, uh, mnemonics, Mr. T and the Bean. All that stuff might go, you might go, what the hell does that even mean? But when you get a weird memory clue like that, it sticks forever. In fact, you probably go home after this and the only thing you'll remember is Mr. T and the Bean. So that's how powerful a mnemonic is. So I'm gonna do a lot of mnemonics in the class. Strange memory clues. Uh, but the thing is to start off as simple as you can. So here's a simple simplification of me just testing the pencil out, learning to love the pencil. So I'm over here in the corner learning to love the pencil. And then I did a little drawing based on that method of learning how to love the pencil. So break it down. See if you can get it as simple as possible. Every time you find yourself in detail world, stop. See if you can just keep in the broad, the broad world and come back out at the end. And with a round of applause for yourself, having not got lost in the weeds. So very easy to do. So what I do to start and, and, and you primarily work in charcoal, correct? Yeah, charcoal. So I, here's my main pencils here. So this one, let me get my garlic. This, is, this comes to us all, by the way, some earlier than others. So I work with, I call this my art pencil, even though it's not an art pencil. It's just pe peel and sketch charcoal pencil by Generals. And I use the soft, but it soft and breaks, so I get a medium and hard just in case. This Pierre Norby, 1710, recommended by Jeff Watts, Conte of Paris, brilliant pencil. This is great for streams of consciousness, for going in there. I'll do some now. Now, I've always done this. I've always, like I said, here's what I always did as a kid, this figures of eight. Getting smaller and smaller and smaller. But note, it's not just side to side, it's at an angle. And it's a broad end, and it's a thin end, and it's a broad end, and it's getting smaller all the time. That was my streams of consciousness. And then I saw an artist called Tim Gulia. I hope I pronounced that right. And he did it so beautifully, because I expand these. I, I go in there, and I join. I just doodle. I just doodle everywhere I am and just feel. I just called it loving the pencil, learning to love the pencil. So I, I do that all the time, and I find all the directions of it like this. And I saw him, Tim Gullier, make an art out of it. He made art. He started doing these strange shapes. And so that's what I do. I go in now and I ex expand the whole paper and make it, make it art. Get in there and feel, just feel that gestural hand. Feel how I can get a broad, come down almost a vertical straight just by holding the pencil like a monkey. Pick it up like that. And then you can go in there and you can start getting these streams of consciousness. Get in and get big, wild lines. Go heavier on it. Get light. See how light you can get. See how low you can go on the broad like this. Change your arm. Look how beautiful the gestural hand is as well. Get in there. How much tone, how light can you get? 
And that pencil needs a bit of a sharp on it. Let me see if I've got another one. I'll sharpen the pencil. I sharpen the pencil on little sandpaper blocks like this. And note how I'm turning it all the time like that. And that can be meditative as well. Now, Manny, I can take questions as I'm talking. Yes. So if you've got any there, and I'll just stream some consciousness. Had, give me one second. I'll, I'll pull it up. That's a better pencil. So while Manny's looking for questions there, note how I'm really loving that pencil now, learning to love it. I didn't lear love it so much a second ago because it wasn't sharpened properly, but I love it more now. And as you're drawing, turn your pencil. I just turned it there on the, on the fly. Turn your pencil, and you'll sharpen your pencil on the page as you draw. Now, look at that. Okay, pencil. I think we uh, yep, I found it. This is from Curtis. So the revelations that one gets when they're learning seem to slow down the more you learn. Yeah. Or do, does it? Yes. Uh, for you? Or, and do you have any advice when you're stuck at that, at that uh, valley yeah. or, or slowing down and trying to yeah. pick back up steam? Yeah. Love it. Love the plateau. What has happened is that you've got into a position where you're mastering something and you think that you're not going any further, but what you are doing is what I'm doing right now is you're learning to love what you've, what you've learned. So don't try and speed up. Keep on with what you're doing and then new revelations will, will occur as you're drawing, as, you're do, as I'm doing this here. I'm starting to go, oh, that's a nice line. Oh, that's a beauty there. So you're in the world that you were when you were a child you, you're, not, you're not concerned about the future because you, you don't think about the future. Children don't think about the future. They have no understanding of it. They're always in the now. So you're in the now now. So stay in the now now. That's a mnemonic, by the way. So I'm always looking for mnemonics. If I can find a strange, a strange phrase or a strange memory clue in a song or something like that, I'll stick with it. So be in the now now and remember that is a great place to be because I'm in the now now, right now. I'm loving this pencil, I'm loving those curves, you know? Sort of disappear from the world like a child and stay with where you are and then something will happen. You'll go across here somewhere like this, you know, you'll go over here and you go, that's a nice shape, that's a nice shape. And you might incorporate that s somewhere. Oh, that going outside the lines is actually nicer than staying inside the lines. You know, you're just not concerned and so you've opened your mind to possibilities. You know, I'm, I'm liking this constant change of rhythm here. That's, that's really quite beautiful. You know, how could I use that in a, you know, an alien architectural building? See, maybe it's flutes at the bottom. Maybe people come out of these tunnels. Things like that just happen when you let your mind fly. And sure, in the background, what you can do is, if you really are stuck, is open an anatomy book and maybe just draw an arm or something that you're not too clear on. And just at that point, use that as an exercise to, to turn your pencil. You know, you could be drawing an arm, go into an art, art book and start drawing an arm and feel in, you know, the tricep come around like this and maybe you go around to the bicep. And all the time you're not thinking of the bicep, you're thinking of this pencil, thinking of the tricep thinking of that lovely gradation that you can put here for the inside of the tricep, the anconius coming around like this, little pinch of the, the bicep, or sorry, the, the pectoralis there, you know? You can just feel it, but at the same time, what you're really doing is just this. You're just doing that. You're learning to love your pencil, you're understanding some new stuff, and you're loving the world again of art rather than being intimidated by it or using it like a corporate idea where I have to be at this certain spot at this certain time. That's nice, see? I like that. I like that little curve there, that little, little veil that's going across and that line that goes on top. And everything you're doing here right now, the second you walk into your life draw class, I do this before life draw. When you walk into your life draw class, you're already drawing. You're already hot. You know, you're not walking in there cold. 
because you've done all the tricky stuff, which is the pencil, the, the curves, the shapes, the rhythms, all of that's already in your, in your hand. You've warmed your hand up. Your, heart, your hand is ready to draw now. You can draw anything that comes at you. So yeah, I hope that, I hope that answers your, your question. I wonder if that's Curtis that I know. Is that Curtis from, is that Curtis from Canada? Might not be. Well, I just I'll, let him, I'll let him say if, he, if it is. I just thought of Curtis from Canada there. Would it be him? All right, I have um, another question. Just give me one second. Okay. Uh, it was about your, throughout your work, uh, do you have any favorite anecdotes or stories <laughs> from your time working in concept art or, or studios? I tell you that, who's or just who, learning? Who's opening that door? Because you know, that was, uh, there's been about four times here where I went, Patrick, shut up, shut up, every single time. <laughs> that was Jonas Calhoun. Oh, Jonas, all right, I know who that is. Let me think. Let me think of one I can say. Uh, Jesus, there's so few you can say without being in court. Oh, jeez. Let me get any other question, and I'll come back to that one. Ask me, and I'll see if I can dig something out that's repeatable. Okay. Um, we we we've, we've talked a little bit. Of, we've talked about this quite a bit. But if you could say one thing to your younger self, uh, what would you say? I would say, whew, I would say, don't copy, don't copy so much. I would say, you know, we grew up in a time where Andrew Loomis would say, find the best copy, which meant find the best reference and keep searching for it until you get the perfect reference and then just copy that. And sure enough, you got a great drawing out of it and then Everyone thought you were the best artist in the world, but really what you did is you spent more time in the library looking for reference. So I would say, learn to interpret the reference. Learn to say, well, if you're drawing that arm here, coming down in that angle there, then what would it look like if you threw it backwards here like this instead and brought the, the deltoid to here and the bicep to there and the brachial radialis to here and the anconius to there, you know? Learn how it works from a different angle, that kind of thing. So if you're just copying the perfect reference every time, what happens is that you, you end up needing that perfect reference every single time. And then you become stultified. You won't, you won't do anything until you've got perfect reference. So learn to interpret the reference. Like I was showing that little cartoon sort of version of Amanda. And the way they learn to draw cartoons, the animators, is to look at real life and interpret it as much as they, as they like. So that, don't copy. So if you have a chance to change the reference, then go for it. Remember, it's only a drawing. You, you won't die from this, you know? You want to feel it and understand it. Get it into your, your mindset that the mileage is the mo most important thing. So rather than render from a great photograph for 60 hours or something, get 20 screenshots, have a look at the, you know, just look on television and draw 20 small quick drawings from, from a movie or something. That would be better. And then you, you haven't got time to copy. You've only got time to interpret. Yeah, don't copy so much. Speaking of movies and television, yeah. uh, do you have an, a favorite animated film and why? <laughs> a favorite animated film? Yes, Pinocchio. Pinocchio was my favorite animated film of all time. And some of it's political. Some of the reason for that was that it was made just on the edge of the Disney greats and their amazing successes. But it was right on the cusp of this costs so much we can never afford this again. So basically what happened was the, the artists wanted better pay and they went on strike and Disney broke the unions and said, no, there's no unions here. And they all went off to UPA and other different places and created great work, incredible outlandish stuff. And the Disney studio fell apart. And there was never a better film after Pinocchio because they brought in time and motion people to say, well, if you can get these many frames done a day, you can get them, like Schindler's List, you know? You can get these many bullets made a day. Uh, but that was what happens, the machine broke down yesterday. 
You know, there's no excuses. And so the artists now are working like slaves. So with Pinocchio, it was all there. They drew as they pleased. You'll see a book out there called They Drew As They Pleased, and it was those times. And in Pinocchio, everything was on the table. I want to I wanna do an underwater scene. I want to I wanna go through this town as if it's a real camera, not a 2D image. And they built the machine around it, a rotoscope machine. And they went inside, and it was gorgeous. And I still I look think, at still Pinocchio today. Like, as, yep. No, no, I agree. I think uh, the opening scene with all the clocks, yeah. the, that, that is the biggest yeah. flex in animation. That's it. That's right. I said rotoscope machine. I meant to say the, um, and once again, that's another one that will come to me. Uh, the multi-plane the camera. Yeah, yeah the, okay. the multi-plane camera. So they built okay, yeah. all these planes of glass, which today sounds like really old-fashioned nonsense. But back then, it was killer edge. They went through those, those planes. And also, it was the time when I first saw Disney, because we're spoiled by Disney now. Today, you can just turn on the television and see a Disney movie. Back then, they, the marketing was so brilliant. They, you could only go to the theater and see it. And so millions of people went out and saw the movie all at once. And so Disney made millions of dollars within a weekend. And now you can just stream them. So for us to see Disney was impossible, because I lived in this burnt out ruin of a place. And the British soldiers came over. And they, with a big, just a big bed sheet in the local school, they presented Pinocchio. Because I learned this too when I was in the Navy, that in the Army and Navy, they get access to movies that other people can't have, so that when they're isolated on a boat or something, they can watch. Like, I watched Alien about seven months before it came out. And when I came out, I went, have you seen the new movie? And they, nobody knew what I was talking about. I'd watched it in the middle of the ocean. It was brilliant. That's amazing. Yeah, it was. And so we saw Pinocchio in that school, and I never forget the magic of when that, especially because I'd never seen a, uh, you know, being so close to your camera, uh, with spools, and it was do, 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 to get here, the, and watching that come alive on the screen. So there's that. There's the memory of it was so beautiful to go and see it live like that. But also the film itself. It's never been better. My favorite Disney artist was there. Uh, he died really young. And for the life of me, I can't pull his name out. He was just fabulous. And he invented all the characters. He was the one that changed Mickey Mouse to be more fluid. I'll, I'll not try and remember, and then I'll remember who he is. No, it was before him. He was one of the very first. He didn't live long enough to be one of the old men, for instance. He, he died at 36, I think. And he was the one that, because they were frightened of Disney, and Disney would look at the rushes. And Disney came in one day, and he had changed Mickey Mouse to look like the Mickey Mouse we know today. Remember, he used to have just two dots, and he would whistle. You could hardly speak. Well, he went in and changed it. And Disney ran through the rushes like this. And he stopped and he said, who did this? He rewinded it. He says, who, who changed Mickey? Because that's a lot of money. You know, that's, that's a day's work that he got paid just messing around. And he said, I did. He said, that's how we draw Mickey from now on. And there was the genius of, of Walt Disney. He was, he was prepared to say, let's collaborate here. And he collaborated. So yeah, for all those reasons, Mickey, or uh, Pinocchio. And the story itself, just fabulous. Everything about it. So memory, <laughs> memory, memory plus the actual art itself, that one. I also yeah, love the Iron, no. I also love Sorry, the Iron Giant. The Iron Giant recently there, I loved that. I love the retro aspect of it. Yeah, yeah that's uh, a fantastic movie. That well. was great film. Great film. And the, in, in the, the uh, Incredibles. I thought that was terrific. So there's great stuff right. being done now. I'm not so keen on the 3D movies. I think they've lost something. So when a TD, 2D movie comes on, or a, especially a stop motion movie, I'm all eyes. I just love it. So organic. So Nick yeah, Parks. Um, is well, I'm, I'm personally a fan of uh, Kubo and, uh, and the two strings. And yeah, I've heard Pinocchio. about it. I haven't and seen the, that and yet. Guillermo del Toro's Pinocchio is also really Yeah, cool. I've got to see that too. But I've heard the one you're talking about is really terrific too. It's gorgeous. Well, gorgeous. I'll have to gorgeous. check them out. Yeah. Good question. Okay, well, we, we have uh, one, one or two more questions. We're in, near in the end. Yeah. Um, what would you like to see more of in the modern fantasy genre? And do uh, you actually, do you have a favorite book as well? 
Oh, you mean in the fiction idea of it? Yeah, in sci -fi science fiction and fantasy, what are your favorite books? I'd, lo I'd like to see Les Kemp. I loved it when it was, I know it sounds like, oh, you're so dull. I liked it when it was all about discovery. I loved the time machine. That's my favorite one of all time, the time machine. I loved that he went into the future and it was the first time he was in the future. So I'm not keen on, it, let's say, we'll bring it into the visual world. If I turn on a TV show and it starts with a guy and he's got a meat pie head on it instead of a real head, I go, oh, he's the alien. And he's talking with a Boston accent. I just turn it straight off. I just turn it straight off because all the sense of wonder is gone and it's been long gone. Now I know that people love that, you know, I, and I, I love that they love it, but it's not for me. So what I think is lost is the sense of wonder. Everybody now in the future is just hanging out with the aliens and they go fishing and stuff. I love the sense of wonder. And when, when the time traveler goes into the future and he meets the Eloy and the, and the Morlocks and stuff and he had never seen or heard of him before, it's just, I'll never forget how, how wonderful that was as both a movie in the 1960s, not that remake, which was, once again, too familiar. You know, there was no wonder in it. So the 1962 version of The Time Machine, and I watched that before I read the book, and then I read the book and loved the book. So, you know, I'm not so much of a purist that I go, oh, I'll only read the book. You know, it's not as good as the movie. I love the movie just as much as the book. So The Time Machine... And, you know, that First Contact ones I like. And I like that one, that Star Trek movie, actually, First Contact. I thought that was really creepy. So anything where it's happening anew. So I've just written my, that novel, and it's all about everything's new, you know. You, you've never seen this before. This is incredible. You know, so someone out of, a fish out of water is, be, is missing now, I think. You know, that's the adventure for me, is the, the person that we see the th adventure through has never seen anything like this before. And that's what made Alice in Wonderland so amazing. When so like the old Star Trek. Yeah, like old this, Star this, Trek. Yeah, yeah. This, this, this were always fantastic. You never know what's gonna happen. You never know what's around the corner. And it's all for the first time. And like I say, Alice in Wonderland, when that book was written, Alice was crazy too. So Alice was this kooky kid. And as the author was writing the book, he went, it's not working. And he worked out it wasn't working because if everything's crazy, then nothing's crazy. If everything's unusual, then nothing's unusual. And so he made her as plain and as posh a kid as you could imagine. And then the whole world was amazing because she was just st st stumped by everything that was happening. And we saw it through her eyes. And so we were as amazed as she was. I think that's what's missing. And I'd like to see more of that. Yeah, uh, it, that, that, that balance and that contrast of everything being too too extreme or yeah yeah it's just a familiar i just was never key like i say I, i'll only give something a few minutes now in fact if i see that meat pie head you know the one where it looks like it's a meat pie it seems to be on every alien now that's just laziness you know what does an alien look like we'll just put a meat pie on its head that's the alien so that's not fun for me because it's not functional either there's no reason for him to have that meat pie on his head you know the old mm -hmm. stuff was more in interesting where they had tendrils. I go, okay, that's probably some kind of antenna, you know? So that, the, the lack of thought, I think, is the thing. We have one more question. Yeah. About um, books. So can you tell us a little bit more about your books as well as if you had other books you would recommend for new students? Which, All right. which would be the one book you would recommend? What would be the one book I would recommend? It's funny, you know, because I've written these books, and sometimes the title is what's the seller. This, is, this one, I think, would be interesting for anyone that's interested in being a science fiction artist or fantasy artist, because I don't write it as, you know, like a Bible where you go, here's what happened, in the, and if you want to go here, you have to do this. This was written as every picture tells a story. So every picture in it, I talk about where I was at that time and what I was doing and how I got the job or whatever it is. So this is more of a journey through the life of an artist in pictures. Not saying, here's a picture of me walking down the street to an art agency. But mm -hmm. the pictures in there, every one of them, I, I remember what I was doing at the time, why it was a challenge, how I got there. So that's a book I recommend for anyone that wants to be an artist and loves to see the art as well. So that's a collection of my art. The book 
that I would recommend that I've written for drawing, if you just begin, would be The Anatomy of Style. That was the first one I wrote. And the reason I wrote it was I kept forgetting everything, you know? And so I wrote down notes. Remember, why are you making this mistake again? That's so stupid. And I wrote them all down and started doing diagrams. And then eventually I went, you know, this, this could be a book, and I released it. And two publishers called me the very day, or the very week that I put it online as a PDF. This oil painting techniques, and before that one, Manny, the one above there, how to draw from photos. I haven't seen a book where they say how to draw from photos and tell you why it's a problem. You know, it's always just they show some photos and you draw from them. Drawing from photo photos is one of the hardest things in the world because there's so much wrong with a photograph. There's so many millions thi of things wrong with every photograph. So if you copy a photograph, you've already done a bad drawing. It's as simple as that. You've just done a bad drawing because you've just drawn with a cyclopic eye. You've just taken one of your eyes out and drawn as the camera sees things. So that's stupid. So I talk about depth perception, what's missing from that. Also, tangents are everywhere in photographs. And it's all in this course as well, by the way. I talk about tangents, where a line intersects another line, and we lose the, the sense of dimension. Or we just lose the sense of design. You know, the drawing's not designed. That's what I mean by don't copy. If you copy, you're not designing anything. Like, I'm, I'll design this tricep to be a harder edge here, like this and a straighter edge there like that. And it becomes more interesting. I've just designed it. I'll put a harder edge there on the medial epicondyle and you know, branch out these, these muscles a little bit more. So I've designed it to look a little bit more you know, like a, a warrior. You know, they're harder, harder edges. That curve's too curvy. I need to come in here and just straighten that edge up a little bit, maybe soften it. You know? So I'm always thinking about what can I do to make this better as a design? not as an arm. It's still an arm, but I'm designing it, I'm designing it to look like a, a specific arm, the kind of arm that would wear this, you know, this golden bracelet. You know, it would have to be a, a pretty unusual person doing this. It would have to be someone from the future or someone from the past. Or maybe a circus performer. Yeah. But I'm th thinking all the time how to design. You can see it in the drawing from photos uh, picture there. You can see all that design around the face. If you just scroll down, man, yeah, see that face there? So that face, I felt, needed the flow of all that imaginary jewelry. And while I was drawing it, I was, I was imagining the noise it would make. You know, I was just constantly in that streams of consciousness mind as I was making all that stuff up. And note how every line is not the same thickness just at the top of the nose there, for instance, it disappears altogether. That's a, that's a lost line. Usually you can only do that in paint, you, s you blur the edge, but you can do it by just thinning the line until it disappears, and you go, oh, I see, that's a, a lost edge idea that you would see in paint. So always be designing, you know, that's, m that's my idea. So drawing from photographs I wrote during the pandemic because there was no life draw classes. Everyone's drawn from photographs, even more so. And I wanted to point out what was wrong with that idea and also what is the magic of having a photograph. Praise for the camera is one of the chapters after it seems like I'm saying photographs are a terrible thing. I never am. I'm always just looking at one side and the other and finding the gray in between that we can use as artists. So the photograph is the most wonderful gift to an artist and also the most nefarious. It's, it's just... It's wet, ready to trip you up more times than it's ready to help you. That's the problem with photographs. So I recommend, <laughs> I recommend that one. But Anatomy of Style is for beginners. Figures from Life, I think, is, is uh, my best book. But it doesn't have that catchy title. And so it's a, a carry-on from the uh, Anatomy of Style. So there's Figures from Life. I think that's my best book right there. So if, for the person that was asking about writing books and being an artist, if you're going to write a book, a, a title is so important. You know, Figures from Life doesn't have the same kudos as uh, the anatomy of style, because everything's in the title. Learn how to draw anatomy, and you can draw with style. Figures from Life, it's a little bit of a pun. Uh, figures from Life, you know, I just couldn't really get that thing. 
Uh, it sounds like you're just drawing from, from a life drawing studio, but I meant figures from life, the life of it, you know, drawing the figures from the life of it. So I didn't quite come across, still not coming across, I might change the title. <laughs> <laughs> That's my favorite That's book. My favorite book. <laughs> That's my favorite. And I think we have one last question because yeah. we are at a, a time. Um, for those books that are out of uh, out of stock, will there be more reprints, or do you recommend the ebook? The ebook's all there is for now. You know, pr okay. printing has become so expensive since I don't want to get political, but you all know why everything's more expensive now, right? So it's become so expensive to pa to print paper and deliver the paper through the canals of the world, that publishing has just grinded to basically a rusty halt. Anatomy of Style is due for a reprint, but it's been due for a reprint for the last seven months now, and because of the way the expense of fuel and everything, it's just not, it's not viable to, to print the book at the minute. So not for a long time. But, uh, you know, if I lived in America, if I was here in America, then I could print these books, because I would probably only print to America and have the road network deliver them. But since these books are printed in Asia and they move and they're printed out of London, I don't print the books, by the way, for anyone that calls up, when are you gonna print your next book? I don't print them. The publisher, Correro Press, prints them. So ask Correro, he's a wonderful man. He'll get back to you, uh, yak. And he's due to, to print at least the anatomy of style, but it's gonna take some time. I, I, I have no estimated have no time of arrival. All right. Well, yeah. Thank you. I think. Do you have any final? Sorry, any final words? I think we're. Oh, for me, Manny. Yeah. 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 I think um, of the takeaway from what we've talked about today. I think we have to learn to love the process, and not worry so much about the outcome. So learn to love the drawing, and the outcome will find itself. So I see a lot of young artists, and they're, they're beating themselves over their head. You know, they're going, I'm 25, I've missed the boat. 25? That's just an egg cracking open. That's all that is. You know, the fact that you're drawing it all. You know, you've still got another 40 years of your lucky 50 years to do this. And at 25, you only just should only just be finding your way. I mean, if I look at the stuff I did at 25, the bar was, it wasn't so much that it was low, it was that less people were doing it. And so you needed all the skills of learning how to draw and mix paint and all that stuff. That took a long time. So basically, we were just embryos. And now, you know, there's so much more competition and digital tools make it feel like, and there's a lot of people pretending they're better than they are and a lot of fast time-lapse stuff that makes you feel like you should be further ahead. If you're drawing every day, you're as far ahead as you're going to be for anyone in the world. So I'd say be easy on yourself. Love the process and you'll get where you're going. It's as simple as that. If you say, I'm not as good as this person, then that's, a, that's toxic. You know, never, never worry about that. It's not about you and another person. It's just between you and the page. And if you're getting love about, out of that, you can't be happier than that and can't wish for more. So love the process. Love what you're doing. Follow your own path. If you love your drawing, someone else will love them. Don't try to be someone else. It'll be frustration. Be yourself. If you admire someone, sure, copy their style, see what you can learn from it, and then grow off of that. There are no rules, but love in the process, I would say, is your gateway to success. Thank you, sir. Really appreciate all this. <laughs> and taking the time for being here today. You're welcome. Yeah. Thanks, Manny. Thanks for all the great questions, sir. Thank you. Well, all right. Well, everyone, thank you so much for, for being here and watching us today. And I hope you all have a good rest of the day.